finally a truly unified architecture. While in autoregressive LLMs, we have a tech generating module, video understanding, image understanding, audio generation, all stitched together. So they're trained separately and stitched together. With diffusion, we can actually merge them a lot earlier in the training and train it as a what, as a single model as opposed to stitching a bunch of them together. We don't need to have separate processing for the vision images and for text and we, need to gen we don't need to generate them separately. Here, this model will generate image and text at the same time together with the same model, same thing. It's unified and this allows it to have also unified understanding of both of them. It's not separate, two separate things. So we start with an image, corrupted image. So now I'm talking about generation. So we started with a corrupted image, noisy image and noisy text. And gradually it refines, it generates both of them at the same time using diffusion, using uh, discrete flow matching. And so unlike autoregressive LLMs that just predict the next token, this guy can predict entire sequence at once and it predicts entire sequence at once. So the entire sequence, the image and text, can depend on each other and it can edit and adjust any part of the sequence until the whole sequence is good as a whole. Most important thing, there is a single transformer, single transformer backbone and it attends to all of the modalities at the same time, like image, text, uh, audio, and they all have same latent space. So they, uh, that means that understanding between them, image and text and audio is a lot closer and better in cross-modal understanding than in autoregressive transformer that has these different parts trained separately and stitched together. Now I will show you on an example how this is done with this uh, discrete flow matching. So discrete flow matching is like a newer cousin of diffusion where it's also diffusion. I mean, it's also um, converting noised stuff to clean images like diffusion. Join my school to become AI researcher. First 100 members get for in for free, so now it's 42. We got courses and videos coming up every day. Hurry up while it's free, link in the description. Just a reminder, if you have a sequence, the cat sat on the mat. Uh, the way we would do diffusion is uh, in the training, we can mask, replace some of the tokens with the mask tokens and then ask the model to predict the tokens that should go here instead of mask tokens. And that's how we train it. But during inference, we would start with all mask tokens that sometimes appeared in the training as well, and then just apply the same schedule and uh, denoising it will generate a sentence. We can also use some tricks. For example, if an unmasked guest token has a low probability, for example, it guesses like four tokens, we can take two of the lowest tokens, low probabilities, and mask them again for the next iteration. And so that way we can kind of mask out low probability tokens until, uh, and then let it repeat until like all of the tokens are a bit higher probability. That's like one trick used somewhere, but not everywhere. But this particular remasking of low probability tokens has, a disadvan has its disadvantages because sometimes low probability tokens are the correct answer, are maybe even more creative or will lead to correct solution. So. I'm just uh, saying like, uh, this is not the best ultimate method. So in next Omni, we can not only have text, but also image uh, tokens. So here, this is example, image tokens for dog photo and text just following that will be, uh, this is my dog, create an image of him wearing a superhero cape. So then uh, on top of those that prompt those tokens, image and text, we add some masks. And those masks are placeholders that will generate this image of this dog. And the way it works is model makes a prediction for the dog image, entire dog image, all of the tokens. And then in the next step, it's going to have now a bit less random uh, image of the dog with a cape, but it's still blurry, it's still random. So in the next step, it's going to try to make it a bit better. So it's going to predict all of the tokens and try to make them a lot better. So it refines every single image token, every single token at every stop step. And while looking at the input prompt tokens and the text. Now, keep in mind, those image tokens that I'm talking about are vector, vect uh, arrays of numbers, vectors. They're not pixels. So after they are generated, you need a decoder 
that's gonna convert those latent vectors into actual images. I just made a video about that 47 times faster image diffusion right here, where we use uh, rich representations of smart encoders like Dino and, uh, and maybe Jeppa that understand what the image is, not just know how to convert uh, latent to pixels, but understand like what the image is as well, not just like what a cat looks like, it knows what a cat actually is. And so it can train faster and do faster, so check out this video. And how do they tokenize images? Because if you take some part of an image, let's say 16 times 16 pixels, there is so many possible combinations that it's virtually infinite. So how do you make, like, uh, they have 4 times 4096, so that's about 16,000 tokens. So how do you go from infinite possible tokens to just 16,000 that represent these images? So here, 16 by 16 pixel patch gets a single vector. So that single vector actually contains less data or less fewer amount of numbers than that 16 times 16 times 3, which is RGB. So that will be a lot more numbers, a lot more storage. So this vector represents uh, this, but this vector is smaller and faster to compute. And it doesn't contain all of the details, which is unnecessary. So it just kind of uh, describes this patch of the image without having all of the unnecessary or unpredictable tokens. Like if this pixel is a bit brighter, a bit darker, it doesn't matter. And it's not predictable and it's not important. So a uh, patch token is a token that contains uh, important and valuable information while discarding irrelevant or unpredictable information. And it's a lot smaller. So instead of encoding infinite possible tokens, we have these four code books. Each of them has 4096 different tokens, like vectors. And each of those vectors is like some common thing that's that appears in images like circle, square, line, solid gradient, dotted. Like if so, it so this is for shape. This is for example for texture. This is some colors and some other things. So, and then uh, you can combine one of each, so four in total, to describe millions and millions of possible 16 by 16 images or patches. And so. This is the way to have a, a bit of memory, so just 16,000 vectors, but you can describe millions of millions of different um, possible patches. And so our initial infinite possible uh, combinations of colors, we just bring them down to, uh, because most of those infinite possible combinations of pixels are just random noise. So actually we can, uh, very well fit all of the useful good images into a lot smaller number, maybe millions of possible tokens. And those millions of possible tokens that we can construct uh, for any patch, we get by combining just four of, of these, one of each group, and each group has 4,000. So it's actually a lot even smaller amount that we need to store and process. So let's see how this process goes. Let's say we have some 16 by 16 uh, patch. Let's say it shows maybe grass and sky. So our encoder will convert that into a vector, latent vector. And then we just find the closest vector in each of these four groups for that vector. So maybe the closest vector in the first uh, would be some vector that describes maybe some shapes that are similar to grass shapes. Uh, maybe some vertical lines, maybe for texture and gradient, it's more like grass, sky, texture. And keep in mind that because we are snapping, so we will lose some information because we will snap the real latent vector to the closest that exists in these code books. So some information will be lost, but that's okay. So let's say our four vectors are the first vector in first group, fourth vector in the second, and then third vector in first vector. And so each of these four vectors uh, is a 1024 dimensional vector, for example. And I made a bit of a mistake. So they actually have even better method 
than just concatenating and making it 4,000 long because that's a huge vector. You can actually combine vectors by just adding them element-wise. And so if we add these four vectors element-wise, uh, then the final vector will still have same size, but it will contain information from every single vector. That's how it happens in attention mechanism. That's how tokens can pay attention, for example, in attention mechanism by just adding vectors. Well, here they use the same trick where you can add, like if it's circle, fuzzy, gradient, yellow, you can add all of that information into a single vector by just adding those vectors element-wise. So first number is this vector, first plus first number is this, first number is this, is going to become the first number in this vector, and for second, and for third, etc. So that's going to be it for this video. Join my school, first 100 members for free, become AI researcher, and see you next time. A link in the description.